Good morning, crazy people. <laughs> Hi, Claire. Hi, darling. How are we doing today? You okay? Yeah, I was just saying, um, this is such an amazing event. And my face aches because I was smiling so much yesterday. And the love in this place is just extraordinary. It's really something special. Thanks for being here. Now, I've been working for, for The Love of Horror for the last four years. They've been going for five years. And if I'm not mistaken, you were the first ever guest from the Hellraiser franchise that we've had. Really? Really. I'm honoured. So I, am ve I was very excited it was you, of all people, because you are my favourite of the franchise. Listen, she's a sweet girl, just misunderstood, okay? How many people are big fans of the Hellraiser franchise? <laughs> Does it bother you? I mean, I'm asking them. When people say about Pinhead being the villain of the franchise, of the first movies, Pinhead's not the villain. You're the villain. Little old me. What was that like, sinking your teeth into such a meaty role, a horrible role, if you will? Well, I, I've, I've, got to be, I've got to be honest and say, we didn't think this movie was ever going to be released. It was a low-budget movie, six-week shoot, in a rat-infested dump in North London. And we laughed our heads off the entire time. I mean, we had an absolute ball with Clive, Clive Barker, and buckets of false blood. And we just, we just had a, an absolute ball with each other. And um, no one could have been more astonished than me when about six months later, my agent phoned me and he said, are you sitting down? And I said, yeah, why? And he said, you know that movie you did that we thought would go straight in the video bin? And I said, yeah. And he said, well, the reviews are out this morning and you're the new queen of horror. <laughs> and I said, is it safe for me to go out to the shops? <laughs> but it was, we were all absolutely gobsmacked. We had no idea that 37 years later, I'd be sitting here talking about the movie because for me, and I, I, I do big it up because I'm proud of it, it's a classic, and it is a classic, and I don't think it will ever go away, you know? I could sing the praises of Hellraiser all day in many different ways. There's so many layers to the movie. It's a gothic romance in a way. It's like Dracula for me, the, the beautiful score. Yeah. And then it's underpinned by sadomasochists from hell. And the juxtaposition of this beautiful story of doomed romance, the hellbound heart, it's similar to Edgar Allan Poe's, all that type of stuff, and then these kinky weirdos from another dimension that just want to be dirty and feast well, on I your Well, I think pain. that's right. I mean, it's, it's really multi-layered, this movie. It's a cycle, it gets in your head. So it's a psychological mess, you know. It's, it's, it's a pretty deep movie, and I agree with the Edgar Allan Poe thing very very much but it's so layered and one of the things I I still love about this movie is the fact that the special effects and I remember being um, at, at the studio and going into the workshop where the guys were and boy they were so into their work they knew they were doing something special but they were all handcrafted and handmade and I think you can see that there's no CGI in this movie it's absolutely handmade and to me that's a really special special part of it and the special effects being handmade have i think it's aged it better than you watch some stuff from the 90s and the 2000s the cgi just takes you out the movie the scene of frank coming back to life through the floor in the yeah. first hellraiser is nothing short of astonishing it's it's, it's still it, yeah. incredible and i think some somewhere inside you you know it's it's real because sometimes when I see CGI, part of me just sort of turns off a bit because I've disengaged and I couldn't really say why, but there's something not really happening. And um, yeah, those lads, they, and they've all gone on to do great things, obviously, because that was a really special movie for them and uh, a lot of them had really good careers afterwards. But for me, that's the heart of it. It's all handmade, it's all felt. And, you know, and some of the scenes in that movie are Again, they don't age. They, for me, that movie hasn't aged. The look of it hasn't aged. There's something just slightly tilted about the whole thing. And you can sit it in almost any era. Yeah. 
from the 40s particularly, I yeah, always think. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, and there's, a, you know, quite an atmosphere of film noir about it. So it covers a lot of, of water, the waterfront, Hellraiser. And the, obviously the franchise went where the franchise went. It went to space. It had the remake. It had the multiplayer video game film. But that fa- nothing has ever, even Hellbound, nothing has ever quite captured the tone of that first film. I agree. I absolutely agree. And it's the attention to detail of little things like Frank's dirty fingernails. Yes. Yes. It's, you know what I'm talking about. When you watch Hellraiser the f- and then he's like <laughs> messing with the box and you're just like, mate, just get a brush. Just sort yourself out. <laughs> there's kinky sex. There's violent murders. There's <laughs> it's perfectly normal sex. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There's, there's gooey viscera everywhere, but it's Frank's nails that proper give me the ick more than anything. My God, some of the poor guys. I'm thinking of um, Ken Cranham in um, Hellraiser 2. <laughs> he was four hours in makeup. That makeup is awesome. And then at the end of the day, he was another three hours having it all taken off. And I used to go, go, bye, see you tomorrow. And he'd go, Bleh. So eventually, they fit up a white wine drip. <laughs> I used to sit there for three hours just glugging this white wine while all this stuff was peeled off. <laughs> And his makeup is intense as well. He's like hooked up and he's got the thing on. Oh, his head. it's absolutely extraordinary. The design. And I think one of the things I notice a lot at conventions and yesterday again, the creativity that's come out of this movie, um, the posters, the design of the DVDs, and, and just the stuff I noticed people wearing yesterday. This is a very creative tribe. Uh, uh, horror fans and this movie has just brought that out in people yes. it's extraordinary there's, there's definitely a few creeps that I know yes, my creeps yes. and there's definitely a little bit of bondage down there in the casual clothing yes it, yes. it, it seeped in <laughs> I'm surprised you're not wrapped in bandages with a little bit of blood soaking through the bandage stall is to the bottom of the <laughs> has anybody got questions for Claire if you have please yeah. throw your hands up we've got Tim with the roving mic, he'll come and find you. Um, if you don't have questions, I've got other questions and things to talk about. But um, I'm going to see what anyone else wants to. And then I've also got a little message from Peter Atkins, which we'll talk oh, about shortly. Oh, my God. So I messaged Peter. Just say, he just said, well, I, I'll be doing this with Claire this weekend. Have you got any interesting or funny stories? Do you know what? I'll do it now, actually. Um, and he said, I'm going to read it almost verbatim because I said, if I'm being a cheeky bastard, tell me. And he's like, you're not being a cheeky bastard, it's fine. Um, <laughs> hang on, it'll come up in a second, I'm sorry. Um, so, while I'm waiting for Instagram to load so I can get me messages, what was the difference between going from Hellraiser 1 to Hellraiser 2? Was there a difference in the behind-the-scenes team? Because I know Clive had moved on by that point. The first one looked like very yeah. good guerrilla filmmaking, very punk rock. It was quite Clive's, Clive's troop. Of friends. Yes, yes. And was it was it like that on set? Well, I think by the time we got to do number two, we we already knew that we were onto something, you know, special. But I, I wasn't into that much because a lot of um, Hellraiser two is a body double, skinless version, skinless Julius. So, um, but I used to go on set sometimes and just sort of keep an eye on her, you know, <laughs> make sure. She was being sufficiently horrifying. Um, but, yeah, we, we already knew that, you know, we'd done one and that people loved it. So we had more confidence, I think. But we also knew we were reaching quite a big audience at that point. So um, there was more money, you know, um, and it, it was more professional, I suppose, which I slightly regretted because I really loved the, rough, the roughness of making Hellraiser 1. And honestly, if you could see that house we filmed in, which I think was condemned shortly afterwards. No, no. The, it, w- the house has now been split into like a couple of apartments. Oh, of course. It's posh apartments now. It's, it's posh apartments, yeah. People still go and take pictures outside. I know they do. <laughs> <laughs> I sometimes wonder what the uh, occupants of the apartments um, get. Who are those people? Yeah. Why, why are there people outside wearing lots of leather? Yes, and, and why are they leaking blood? I don't understand. <laughs> Right, I've got it. Hang on, bear with me one second. So I, I messaged Peter yesterday. Oh, yeah. And he said, um, 
Christ, I'm not sure if I've got anything useful. The only personal anecdote I've got is something I'm not sure she'd even remember. If you're really stuck for material, which I'm sure you won't be, Peter overestimates my ability for material. <laughs> um, you could whip out this clumsy, long-winded nonsense. He says, During the ADR sessions for Hellbound, Chris Fig asked me to sit in with Claire while she looped some dialogue. Should have been Tony R, but he was at Pinewood that day for some reason. My primary job was to keep her company in the boring downtime and get her lunch at the commissary. When we were there, I stood in line for a long time and had a nice chat with some older bloke dressed in Tudor drag. When I got back to our table, I handed Claire her food. She grabbed my arm and said, my God, what did he say to you? And I said, who? She looked at me like I was the village idiot and went, Charlton Heston, for Christ's sake. You've just spent five minutes with Charlton Heston. <laughs> it is true. Wow. It is true. And he had no idea. Absolutely no idea at all. Jordan Hesden. This is Ben Hur. <laughs> I quite like the idea that Peter is just so nice to everyone. He's like just having a chat. Yeah, because like... he's such a nice guy, you know. But Charlton Hesden, for heaven's sake. Wow. You'd think, wouldn't you? I mean, you, you think he, well, he's in chew the drag, so it might be more difficult. Yeah, well, you know, yeah, that was a bit weird. <laughs> he wasn't even filming, he was <laughs> just there. It's just his normal streetwear. Just his normal, yeah, just, just his regular streetwear. What was it, that group like, though? The Clive Barker, uh, Peter Atkins, Doug Bradley? Were they, were they like a little trio of trouble, or? No, I mean, I have to. There was such a, like I say, it was such a great atmosphere on that first movie because we didn't expect anything. We we were just there, and we never stopped laughing. Wow! All, all, all the time, because it was, you know, you're dealing with all this quite extreme material, and. Um, you know, you're on set for 12 hours a day. And we just used to have the giggles all the time. In fact, when Ken Cranham and I were doing Hellraiser 2, and I've known Ken, you know, for decades, and we couldn't stop laughing. And the producer had to come and say, just stop it, you two. And we went, okay, okay, okay. And then we get back, action, and we just... <laughs> we couldn't stop because that's the relief the release of when you're working with dark stuff you do you just go off into gales of hysteria well, that sort of answer another question was going to be is it hard being in that mindset but obviously you want you want to get away from it yeah i mean that happens often on sets you know you think why well, it happens in rehearsals for serious plays as well you just can't stop laughing because you're dealing with all this death and destruction and... And it just comes out. Well, and it just comes out. It's a reaction. But, no, I mean, Julia particularly, that was a really... For me, that was a classic role. And that's how I tried to play it. Um, I thought it was a, a wonderfully dark... And, you know, back, back then, women weren't really doing th that much interesting stuff in, in British film. And I was really amazed when I read that script... So actually shooting it, shooting the scenes, it was like shooting a Jacobean tragedy. Or it, re it really It really is. was, because it's deep psychological stuff. And I think, you know, I've had so many women, like yesterday, come up to me and say, <laughs> you're my role model. And I say, why? He said, that's a really feminist film. <laughs> you don't like a bloke, you get your hammer out. Bang, there you go. I thought, I've never been a feminist icon before, but I'll take it. Yes, I think so. I think so. <laughs> and a lot of blokes sometimes, um, I might just be on a train or something or walking down the street, and quite often people are coming towards me and they look at me and they can't quite place... Where they know you. They've seen Hellraiser. They can't quite place. And they just look at me and they go... And they move away. They just move away and they're like, I, I don't like that woman. I don't even know why. Bad vibes. Yeah. But all of, you know, filming or being on tour all over the world, I can't tell you how many people I've met who just love this film. And there's been times like when I've thought, oh God, you know, I don't know what to do now in Berlin or I'm lost or whatever. And somebody will go, Julia from Hellraiser. I say, yes, you come this way. It's absolutely extraordinary. That's incredible. It's incredible. It, Hellraiser for me, I, I saw it as a kid. I didn't fully connect. I don't think How I was... How old were you? I'm probably about 11, 12. Oh, illegal. I know, I know. 
and I don't think I was mature enough or intelligent enough to appreciate it. Maybe ten, maybe ten years ago or so, yeah. I sat back down and rewatched it properly with a, with a somewhat of an adult brain, and it really, really just sat with me. Yeah. To the point where Hellraiser is sort of my comfort film, and I, I know that sounds really strange. No, no, it doesn't. I lob it on in the background. The score, the performances. It's yes. like a it's like a tone poem in a way. It is just it is just wonderful. The whole the thing as a whole. Obviously, there's layers. But like everything from you, just fucking people up with a hammer. I just, I, I just, love that. It's I a tone it. poem. Do you know what I mean? It's like yeah, yeah, I do. Hell, hell ra- it's what would the kids say these days? Hellraiser's a mood. It's a vibe. What do they say? Is that what they say? Is that what the kids say? It's a mood. It's a vibe. Oh, it's a mood. It's a mood. It is. It is a mood. And Eleven. I mean, it's, it's Eleven. A tone when poem. you saw that at my desk yesterday, we started. I started saying to people, "How old were you when you first saw it?" And the youngest we had was five. Whoa. And I said, have you had a lot of therapy? Or are you just... Okay? He said, no, no. He said, I think it's... I've been watching it all my life, ever since I was five. He said, it's my comfort film yeah. now. Hell, hell bound to a lesser extent, but I will put them on one after the other. Yeah, a lot of people watch them back to back. Yeah. Mostly just the first two, to be honest. I do, yes. li- I do like the rest, but I feel once you exit the, 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 the... Not to kiss your ass too much, once you exit the franchise, it sort of loses the way for me. It did for me, obviously. Oh, yeah, cause... Um, and, you know, someone said to me yesterday, have you watched the remakes? I said, no. Last year, the, re- the remake oh. reboot from last year, I quite liked it more than most of the sequels. I thought it was really good. The, design, the, the, the creature designs weren't as good as when you did, did them, but it was, it was interesting. Um, the, uh, Pin, Pinhead was transgender. The costumes were made of skin. It, again, it was, it was the moodiest version of Hellraiser since the second one, so it was a big, big win for me. I will watch it at some point, but I just feel a bit possessive. I, I can understand why. <laughs> you know. The queen of horror? You don't want someone <laughs> pissing on your throne? Absolutely. <laughs> Tim, we've got a question. Us. We've got two questions. My goodness, watch him run. Uh, do you know what? Hello. Hello, love. It's my comfort film, too. If I'm having an absolute melt, Hellraiser will like make me go to sleep. It's lovely. Um, really lame question, but I need to ask. Do you have a favourite Cenobite? Do you have a favourite Cenobite? Um, no, to me, because I only ever thought in character as the Cenobites, and to me, they were, they were in a different world. To me, as an en- they were an entity, to me. They were the, the Cenobites. Um, but Butterball, I suppose. Yeah, Simon. Um, Simon, and I, I just, every time I looked at him, I just went <sighs> But again, that's down to the incredible design. Yeah of those, well, you don't really call them costumes, the design of those beings, you know, and I could never encounter him in, in costume, I suppose you'd have to say, in a corridor or whatever without sort of shrinking back, even though I knew it was lovely Simon, you know. There is, that affected me, that one. Is that element of realism as well? That it's, not, it, it's, not too, it's not too far? It, it's not exactly. Yeah. It, it got the tone right. It didn't... It wasn't over the top. It was just, it got you in the pit of your stomach because it wasn't too much. Like enhanced realism. Yeah, and and something very human about them, which I think is the most disturbing thing. They're not that far removed from from humans. I think if they they were more fantastical, they would lose the impact. I don't think they would affect you in that way because you'd be able to say, oh, it's a... Thing. It's not. It's nothing to do with humans. I mean, for me, what both one and two did brilliantly was exactly that. It's all within the human sphere for me. It's not out there in outer space. It's in here, in your head. And I think that's what Clive Barker did so brilliantly, was keep it in your head. Clive's work in general is so... Like he, well, the guy's a genius. I yeah, mean, I is, say that as an overused word. But that, <laughs> has that man got three brains or something? Because he's also one of the funniest people. He's a scouser, you know. And, um, we're all right. We're, you're all right <laughs> by me, lad. Um, 
and so that's one reason why we laughed a lot on set. Uh, because Clive's a really, really funny man. And he knew the material was, was quite dark. And he would do stuff. Oh, can I tell a story? There's a very, very funny day when we were on set in the rat-infested house. And a rather posh journalist was coming to interview me and Clive. And on the floor, there was half a dismembered torso, you know, covered in pints and pints of fake edible blood. And this journalist clearly had come to say, I think horror is a load of old rubbish. So she was asking these rather pompous questions. And somebody brought us in coffee and donuts. So she asked me a question. I said, I'm with you in a minute. And I took half a donut, bent down, scraped up the edible blood and shoved it in my mouth at her face. And then Clive did the same thing. She was out there in the next two minutes. She couldn't wait to get out of that house. It was hilarious. And uh, I don't think she ever published the article. I can imagine not. She... <laughs> I think she thought we might come after her. Or if they're going to eat that, what, what are they going to do to me? Yeah, I said to her, Donut, who are these people? <laughs> Hair loss. <laughs> so this is what some people do for a living. <laughs> Champagne problems. We've got one more question. Hello. Hi, hi, Claire. Thanks for being here. It's, a, it's amazing to see you. Just, just wanted to hinge on what you said about how it, how it's really aged well. My husband and I, we watch Hellraiser every few months, and it never gets old. It's like the first every time we watch it. It's like the first time we've, we, we're watching it. We watch it every, every few months. Wow. Uh, my question is. Um, in, in Hellraiser, you do get little glimpses um, that Julia is human. So uh, at some point she does, you know, she does want to stop Frank from killing her husband. She does seem to have some, some good relationship with her stepdaughter. And yes. what I was wondering is, do you think that Julia was um, inherently evil or do you think she might have had a normal life if she hadn't have met Frank? She's a woman, darling. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a great question because, as I, as I say, I, what was special about her to me was that she was completely human. And for me, maybe I'm just thinking as an actress who played her, everything she did was normal human behaviour, just upped. So that she did have guilt, she did have shame, she did have you know, all of those feelings. She's, she wasn't a machine, but it was ramped up in this weird Hellraiser bubble, if you like, of, of behavior. And, and to me, that's what was so special about it. She was understandable. And I think you can almost sympathize with her, <laughs> you know, uh, because people understand. Everybody has those feelings. They're just not allowed to act them out. So um, it's, it's, it's great when you can watch somebody act out for you, you know. I'm re it's amazing you watch it. You watch it so often. But a lot of people have said they find things that are new in it uh, every, every time they watch. And as I say, I think that's down to the amazing, amazing uh, design and direction because it's a, you can watch that movie and see stuff. Oh my God. Oh, that's going on in the background, or oh, I didn't realise that that was that, and yeah, it's a complex movie emotionally as well. It's a great question, thank you. I'm really glad you enjoy it. Long may it continue. And that that question is also, it's it's a very human response, and there's always that like you always have the ex partner that like comes back into your life and makes you make these horrendous decisions. We've all been there, we've all done it, we've all had the backslide, except when I got back with my ex-girlfriend 15 years ago, we just had a bad breakup. When you got back with Frank, you just killed a load of dudes. It's just... Just easiest. It's, yeah, yeah. But you know, you read about some of the horrific things that happen on a daily basis, and you think, Hellraiser's pretty tame. She, yeah. At the end of the day, you know, human beings out there doing appalling things to each other, and, mm -hmm. um, you know, God, but... I, yeah, for me, that was really important because psychologically, we all know that. We all know those feelings. We all, at some point, have thought, God, I could just murder you. Um, but Julia does it for you, so you don't have to go to jail. 
<laughs> and that is all we've got time for this morning. Aww. What an amazing way to end it on. Claire, thank you so, so much for your time. Thank you for being here. Just off to slaughter somebody.